Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. My name is Sava, and today we're going to discuss the ARSH model, that is, how to explicitly model the autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity processes in the volatility of your time series. The ARSH model has been first proposed by Robert Engel in 1982 in application to inflation volatility in the UK. Since then, ARSH has become one of the most popular models in financial and macroeconomic time series econometrics. And the reason for it is twofold. First of all, it's a very powerful tool that generates scenarios that are very close to reality, or at least satisfactory close to reality. And second, it's really conceptually simple. It approaches volatility processes in a very intuitive way. First of all, we've got the conditional volatility, which is denoted VT squared here, that consists of two terms that are then being added up together. First of all, we've got the unconditional volatility omega, which happens no matter what. And then we have an autoregressive component alpha times lagged realized volatility, lagged squared residual epsilon t minus one squared. And alpha here is the parameter we are most interested in. That's the Arsh coefficient. The higher it is, the more persistent is the volatility of our time series. And then the actual realized volatility epsilon t squared consists of the conditional volatility, Vt squared, we have just discussed, and the disturbance term, Ut, that can be interpreted either as volatility of volatility or error in volatility modeling, something like that. And then we need to estimate the parameters of the Arsh model so that they best fit reality, and then we can proceed to explaining the results. First of all, we need to calculate the baseline parameters of our time series, that is, what would have we thought of the time series if we assumed that it is homoscedastic, that there are no Arsh processes in our data? Well, we would have just calculated the average of the daily returns. Here we have five years worth of S&P 500 data, just as usual. Then we would have calculated the sample standard deviation, and then to calculate the sample variance, we would have just squared the standard deviation as usual. And as a baseline case, let's assume that we have no Arsh processes in our data. That is, our constant is just equal to the sample average. Our unconditional variance is equal to the normal sample variance. And our Arsh alpha, the magnitude of Arsh processes, is equal to zero. Then our long run volatility would be expressed by a neat formula that is unconditional variance divided by one minus alpha. And to calculate the long run volatility, not the long run variance, we would just need to take the square root of this expression. And we will get exactly our sample standard deviation. This relationship persists whatever the starting values of the model parameters are. Then we would have calculated the residuals. That here would just be the demeaned data, as we have no standard independent variables, no axis, so our residuals are just um, observed values of our dependent variables, y minus the constant, the intercept of our model. And we lock the intercept and subtract it from all the realized values of our y variable. And we bottom right click it all the way down and get our residuals. Then we square those to get squared residuals, the realized volatilities of our time series. And then we lag them by one so that we get our lagged realized volatility for our Arsh modeling. And then we can calculate the conditional variance observation by observation using this formula over here. So first of all, what value of conditional variance should we start with? We have got no lagged squared residual at our very first observation. Well, most of the time, you just plug in the long-run volatility estimator from your Arsh model coefficients, and then you start iterating this value 
in next observations. So here our conditional variance would be our estimator of long run volatility squared and uh, next we will just need to apply the conditional variance formula vt squared. So it's just omega and we need to look omega because we don't want it to change observation by observation. It's unconditional variance that happens no matter what plus alpha the magnitude of the arch process and we lock this coefficient again times the lagged squared residual, the lagged realized volatility that we conveniently have in the neighboring column. And then we enforce this formula and bottom line it all the way down, and we can unsurprisingly see that if we assume our volatility is constant and there are no arch processes in the data, our conditional variance will always be the same and equal to unconditional variance. Then we have a quite intuitive and reasonable question. How one might change those parameters of the arch model, the constant mu, the intercept, that then uh, leads to different values of the residual, that then lead to different values of the squared residual, the unconditional variance and the arch coefficient, how one might optimize those so that our arch model is the best fit to reality? Well, one cannot just apply a regular linear regression, multiply a bunch of matrices together, because we have no matrices, we have no usual independent variables here. So a go-to method here would be maximum likelihood estimation. That is, we need to maximize some likelihood function on our model parameters. And we have already got a couple of videos on maximum likelihood estimation when applied to distribution fitting, so please check those out if you're interested. Here, the likelihood function uh, resembles the normal distribution probability density function quite a lot because that's uh, what we assume our disturbance terms follow. And uh, it is a function that um, plugs in both the realized volatility epsilon t and the conditional volatility vt here in the denominator over here and here in the denominator of the exponent as well. So if we code this likelihood function for all of our observations, figure out the product through all of the observations and maximize this product on the set of parameters, we can reasonably arrive at optimal values for our model. But the catch is that um, optimizing a product is much harder than optimizing a sum numerically. So here we can use the log likelihood function instead and by using the properties of logarithms, just the arithmetical properties of those, we can maximize the sum of log likelihood. So we would calculate the logarithm of this likelihood function for each of the observations and maximize the sum of logarithms instead of the product of the functions themselves. So let's input the uh, likelihood function or the log likelihood function more precisely. So first of all, we type in natural logarithm one over in the denominator, we will have the square root of two times pi times the conditional variance. And we close the brackets for the denominator here. Here, what we have done is that we have inputted the conditional variance, so vt squared, under the square root. So here we have exactly the same term mathematically because the square root of vt squared is equal to vt as conditional variance is non-negative. And then we need to multiply it by the exponent. Uh, the exponent of minus um, squared residual, so a realized variance, divided by two times conditional variance. And then we close the brackets for the denominator, close the bracket for the exponent, and close the bracket for the natural log, enforce this function, and bottom bracket it all the way down. And then we can arrive at our log likelihood function that would just be the sum of all log likelihoods throughout our observations. And then we would need to maximize that uh, given uh, that we can change the values of those parameters. How one might do that? Well, um, a closed form solution here is tricky, so one is best off arguably using numerical methods. And Excel allows us just that. So we can go data solver and specify our optimization task. So first of all, we need to specify the objective function. Our objective function is our log likelihood, so cell G7, and we want it to be maximized, not minimized or set to a value of. And then we need to specify the variables that we 
can change to obtain the optimal value of our objective function. In that case, we can change the three parameters we have, the constant mu, then conditional variance omega, and the arch coefficient alpha. So, cells B5 to B7. And then, we need to specify the constraints on our parameters that we would allow them to fluctuate within during the optimization task. First of all, we need to untick this option, make unconstrained variables non-negative, as we might well expect the constant mu to be either positive or negative. There are no reasons why during reasonably long time periods the constant, the intercept, the expected return cannot be negative, so that's why we untick that. But for the unconditional variance omega and for the arch coefficient alpha, we still expect them to be non-negative. To be more precise, for the unconditional variance, we want the omega to be strictly positive, as zero variance would lead to some notable problems in the estimation, as dividing by zero is not allowed, and uh, also theoretically, as we might expect uh, stock returns to always be slightly unpredictable, so variance never reaches exactly zero. It can be close to zero, but never zero exactly. To do that, we can add a constraint on the unconditional variance, so on cell B6, and we can see here that Solver does not provide any strict inequality restrictions, only non-strict inequalities. But we can slightly tweak it around and state that our unconditional variance omega should be greater or equal to a very small number. So effectively it would be a strict inequality to zero. So we can specify that omega should be greater or equal to one millionth, so 0 0.000001. And that would effectively state that our unconditional variance should be always positive. Then we need to impose a restriction on our arch coefficient alpha. And here, for theoretical and mathematical reasons, arch should be bounded by 0 and 1. It cannot be lower than 0 because, first of all, it would be challenging to interpret the results theoretically. And a value of alpha less than 0 would mean that if there has been higher uh, realized volatility in the previous observation, there would be lower conditional volatility in the current observation. That's quite tricky to wrap your head around why that might happen. So, for theoretical reasons, the Arch coefficient is always expected to be non-negative. It should be less than 1 for mathematical reasons. As we have explained previously, the long-run volatility is basically a sum of an infinite series to some extent, and it's equal to unconditional variance over 1 minus alpha. And if alpha is equal to 1 or greater than 1, then the infinite series would not converge, and we would not have a stable value of long-run volatility. Our conditional variance process would be explosive, and we don't really want that at that stage. So we need to specify that our arch coefficient alpha should be, first of all, greater or equal to zero, and then it should also be less than or equal to one. And that's all the restrictions we need for the solver to optimize our log likelihood. So we can select the optimal solving method, the optimal uh, solving algorithm. Here we can stick with GRG nonlinear, which is basically gradient descent. For a simple enough task as that, gradient descent will suffice. So now we can click solve and wait until the solver finds an optimal solution for the maximum likelihood. And here we can see that we have slightly increased our log likelihood function from uh, 4208 to, to almost 4300, which means that mathematically the Arsh model approximates the reality better than the constant volatility assumption. If we look at the coefficients, we can see that first the constant mu is quite a bit higher than the simple sample average, which is nice to know. The unconditional variance is markedly lower than the constant variance we have calculated at the beginning, which means that, first of all, there are periods of low volatility when uh, realized variance can tend to this value, and there can be periods of high volatility when realized volatility actually exceeds 
the average value. And the arch coefficient is around one third, 0 0.34, which means that there is notable, yet not very drastic, uh, arch uh, heteroscedasticity in the data. And now we can uh, actually calculate our conditional and realized volatility and compare the two to see how well the Arsh model approximates the reality graphically. First, the realized volatility will be just the square root of the squared residual, so realized variance, and the conditional volatility will be the square root of conditional variance. And now we can bottom right click this formula all the way down and look at the graphs that we have just got. So first of all, we can see that Notably, the Arsh model correctly captures volatility spikes and peaks, albeit it doesn't go uh, all the way upwards as the realized volatility does sometimes. It's most notable over here and over here, where the blue graph is much higher than the orange graph. Furthermore, uh, as we can see in the Arsh model, the conditional volatility is strictly bound from below by this value of um, unconditional volatility, in the Arsh framework, conditional volatility and thus expected volatility can never fall below the unconditional volatility. And to illustrate that, we can figure out what is the minimum value of the conditional volatility. And we get 0.69%. And if we square that to get minimum variance, minimum conditional variance, as predicted by the Arsh model, we'll get um, 4.8 times 10 to the minus fifth which is exactly equal to our unconditional variance. So conditional variance in the Arsh model is bound below by the value of the unconditional variance omega, which is easy to grasp from this expression of conditional variance that you have investigated at the start. So what have we got here for the Arsh model? First of all, it is a very decent approximation of reality. It correctly predicts volatility spikes and correctly explains how volatility processes behave in real-world financial and macroeconomic data, but maybe we can do even better. Turns out we can, and in the next video on the topic, we'll investigate the Garsh model, the generalized autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity model. But as for now, that's all there is for today's video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, leave a like under this video if you found it helpful, and I am eager to see any further suggestions on videos for business, economics, or finance that you would like me to record in the future. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.